advocates from across the disability community have been fighting to end the use of contingent electric shock for decades. Contingent electric shock is the practice of using electric skin shock devices to control someone's behavior, an extreme form of ABA that the United Nations has recognized as torture. This torture is currently used at the Judge Rottenberg Center, or JRC, in Massachusetts. For decades, disabled people, service providers, researchers, and disability advocacy organizations have worked to end this and other aversive practices and improve how we support people across the country who have developmental disabilities and who also struggle with mental health, self-injury, and aggression. We know that everyone can be supported humanely and have their needs met in the community, but we still need to make that a reality everyone has access to. That fight is far from over, but this year we achieved a huge milestone. The FDA finalized a ban on the electric skin shock devices the JRC uses. During the six years that the ban sat at the FDA, people were terrorized, injured, and traumatized as the JRC continued to use electric shock to punish and control them. We are relieved beyond measure that soon our community members will no longer be punished with dangerous electric shocks for doing things like standing up without permission, making noises, or crying in pain. Today, we want to celebrate this monumental victory and recognize the many advocates from all corners of the disability community who have fought for decades to make this possible. First and foremost, we want to specifically honor and recognize the many survivors of the JRC. Survival is a powerful act, and all survivors are worthy of recognition. We also want to specifically thank the hard work, courage, and powerful self-advocacy of JRC survivors who spoke out about what they endured. Some testified at public hearings, shared their stories online, or let their stories be told in the media. Others allowed us to privately share their stories with the FDA and other federal agencies. Their contributions, anonymous or not, made this ban possible. In particular, we want to acknowledge Jennifer Masumba and Andre McCollins, whose advocacy and testimony were a critical part of the process that led to the ban. I want to invite everyone watching at home to join me in a moment of silence in recognition for what these survivors have lived through and the power of their voices in speaking out. Thank you. Since our founding, ASAN has fought hard to, use, to end the use of electric skin shock. We worked for years with other advocates on strategies to urge both Massachusetts as well as the federal government to ban these torture devices and to support the people currently at the JRC to receive real services in their communities. Some of that work was public and some of it was behind the scenes. When the FDA held a hearing to ask whether or not it should pursue a ban in 2014, our founder, Ari Naaman, gave testimony in support of the ban. We submitted public comments to the FDA multiple times <laughs> and coordinated with researchers and experts on services and supports to make sure the FDA had all the evidence about why electric shock was wrong and what other options exist to actually help people. With our partners, we held many, many meetings with FDA officials and others in the federal government to make sure that this issue did not fall off the radar. But our formal policy advocacy only had teeth because it was backed by all of you, grassroots advocates who fought to make it clear that no one no matter their disability, deserves to be tortured. We want to thank everyone who created and signed petitions, called the FDA, called your Congress people, organized wait-ins, and made sure that this ban got across the finish line. Zoe Gross, ASAN's Director of Operations, will speak more on these campaigns. ASAN had already been working to end torture at the Judge Rotenberg Center for years before I joined in 2016. But while working with ASAN, I got to work on two grassroots campaigns focused on the electric shock device ban. Our 2018 Stop the Shock campaign and our We Are Still Waiting campaign in 2019. The 2018 campaign is one of the things I'm most proud of from my time at ASAN so far. At that time, it had been years since the FDA's expert panel had officially recommended that the FDA ban the skin shock device used at the Judge Rotenberg Center. But the ban wasn't moving. So for months, our grassroots volunteers called and emailed and tweeted at the office of the FDA official whose division oversaw the ban. This 
wasn't an office that was set up to field calls from the public, nor was it officially accepting comments of any kind on the proposed ban. But that didn't matter. The rule was stalled out, and the FDA had parked it in that office, so we made their phone ring. By the time we got a meeting with the FDA, that phone had been ringing for months. Meanwhile, our online petition to ban the electric shock devices used at the JRC was gathering tens of thousands of signatures. So when we showed up at the FDA, we showed up with three moving dollies, each loaded with heavy boxes full of thousands of pages of printed signatures, nearly 300,000 signatures in all. Because we wanted this to be taking up their time. All of us were very aware that every day the ban wasn't finalized was a day when people with disabilities were being tortured with electric shocks. We couldn't forget that, and we didn't want the FDA to forget it for a second. So we called and we emailed and we tweeted and we signed the petition, and they spent their time listening to our demands, reading our words, and processing the hundreds of thousands of signatures that we brought to their door. And soon after that, we got word that the rule was moving. Even when a federal agency is working on a proposed rule, regulations often don't move fast, and this one didn't. So in 2019, one year after our Stop the Shock campaign, and five years after the FDA held its first hearing on skin shock devices, we decided to remind the FDA about our demands. We knew they were working on the rule, and that was important progress. But we needed to remind them that we were watching and that we expected them to keep working on it as fast as they could. So once again, we called and we emailed and we tweeted and we got Congress involved. Self-advocates across the US got their members of Congress to sign a letter urging the FDA to finalize the ban. The theme for the 2019 campaign was, we are still waiting, waiting for the ban to pass. So grassroots organizers held wait-ins in 10 cities across the US, many of them outside of the Department of Health and Human Services regional headquarters in different cities. Each wait-in lasted five hours uh, to symbolize the five years since that first FDA hearing. Five years that our community members at the Judd Rotenberg Center had been tortured while waiting for the FDA to act. At the wait-ins, advocates read statements calling on the FDA to stop torture and abuse. Some shared their personal experiences with restraint, seclusion, and harmful, aversive therapies. While we waited, we wrote notes to the FDA reminding them of what was at stake, why the final ban was so important, and why they needed to release it as soon as they could. That was last year, and in March of this year, the FDA passed the final ban. What we did in the last few years was just a small part of the decades of work that went into passing it. The investigations, the state and local and federal advocacy, the survivor testimony, everything. But I am so proud of what we did together in those campaigns, and I want to say thank you to everyone who was a part of it. Whether you signed the petition, called the FDA, emailed your member of Congress, got your friends involved, whether you organized a wait-in or demonstrated outside a federal building to hold the FDA accountable, what you did mattered, and it was part of this impossible fight that we won. And you are part of that, along with the survivors, along with the experts, along with the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and our allies in every state and around the world. This victory is precious to all of us. It shows what we can accomplish, even when others say it's impossible. There are more battles ahead of us, and we will fight them and we will win them. But we wanted to take this moment to say thank you for being part of this fight with us. The final ban from the FDA said that after 30 days, the devices could not be used on anyone new. The JRC was given six months to transition people currently subject to electric skin shock off of the devices. The JRC has filed a court appeal to try and stop the ban. That's how dedicated they are to torturing disabled people. We're following the case closely, and we're confident that the FDA will prevail. In the meantime, the JRC asked for the ban to be paused during the pandemic. The federal government has been approving most of those kinds of requests, so unfortunately, the FDA approved that one too. That means that even though it has been over six months since the ban came out, people at the JRC still haven't been taken off the device. ASAN is committed to keeping this fight going until no one, no matter what, is being tortured for their disability. It's not over yet. I want to recognize that ASAN is far from the only organization working on this. ASAN is honored to fight this fight in partnership with countless other organizations and advocates. I specifically want to thank Nancy Weiss, Lydia Brown, Shane Neumeyer, and Allison Barkoff, Cal Montgomery and Dr. David Coulter, Greg Miller, a JRC whistleblower who passed away last year, 
and our friends at the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services, the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, the ARC, ANCOR, the ACLU, and ADAPT. We've compiled a short video where some of these folks have shared their perspective on the fight. My name is Allison Barkoff, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Center for Public Representation. CPR is a national disability rights organization that uses litigation and policy to advocate for the inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of life. For over 40 years, CPR has tirelessly fought against the segregation and harmful and dangerous practices in place at the Judge Rottenberg Center. For decades, we have been privileged to represent people residing in JRC in their fight against the use of electric shock and their fight for placements in a less restrictive setting. We've seen firsthand the physical and emotional harm that JRC has caused to so many people. And at the same time, we've seen the incredible bravery and tenacity of our clients as they've won their fight to leave JRC and have created a life for themselves in the community. We've also worked for the last decade to support efforts by the state of Massachusetts and the Food and Drug Administration to prohibit the use of shock devices. Our advocacy, together with so many others in the disability community, has finally led to the FDA's ban on the shock device. The ban has made clear what we all know, that using shock devices to control behavior is dangerous and harmful. It is not supported by research and evidence, and it does not work. Unfortunately, our fight is not over. JRC is challenging the ban in court, and the FDA has put on hold the requirement that people be transitioned off the shock devices. We vow to continue our fight with you. Electric shock must end for everyone and for good. Hi, my name is Sarah Meek, and I'm the Senior Director of Legislative Affairs with Inker. Um, I was very active um, to get the skin shock ban um, at the lobbying site on Capitol Hill. Um, and I've got to say, I was just particularly honored when Julia Bascom asked me if I could help with that. Um, you know, there had been so many advocates who'd been fighting for that for so long. And... Um, and so many people who had endured that um, and were continuing to endure that, that I, you know, I, w I was just really pleased that I had some skills that could maybe help get that, that over the line. Um, you know, and I think it's, there are very few times in your career when you have real tangible wins like that, that you know make amazing differences in everybody's life who's involved in that. Um, so while I think there's still far to go, I think, you know, especially representing providers, you know firsthand that people can be supported in so many ways successfully in the community that are person-centered, that are free of pain, that are, um, you know, that are just what people want. and. Um, and I feel really lucky that I was able to be a part of it. Um, I, I think we do have a long way to go forward. You know, I live here in Northern Virginia and I'm even shocked as, you know, to hear about restraints and seclusions being used in, um, you know, Fairfax County schools and things like that. So I think this is not the end, but, um, but I'm really committed to continuing to fight. So thank you. And thank you all for all your advocacy. Hi, my name is Nancy Weiss. I want to thank the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network for celebrating the advocacy that will hopefully someday lead to the end of JRC and all places that steal people's freedom and autonomy. I want to thank you especially for honoring Jennifer Masumba and the other JRC survivors who have spoken out forcefully and effectively having the kind of impact that people who haven't experienced life there never could. In 1993, I spent a few days visiting what's now the Judge Rotenberg Center. I was horrified by what I saw. 
As I was leaving, a teenage boy pulled me aside and whispered, can you help me? Can you get me out of here? I left there after a few days as an observer, permanently changed, certain that I needed to do something about the atrocities that I had witnessed. I never knew the name of the young man who had taken a risk in asking for my help, but I've spent the last 27 years trying to do something on behalf of him and others like him. Shortly after my visit, I spoke with the leadership of Amnesty International about the abuses I saw at the Judge Rotenberg Center. They were equally appalled. They wanted to know what was this place, a juvenile detention center? When I told them that the victims were autistic people and people with other developmental disabilities, their response was, yeah, well, we don't get involved in things like that. I said, I knew that they didn't, but why? They said, we're not doctors. We don't know what people like that need. I told them that I didn't think you needed to have any special letters after your name to know what is right and what's humane. Over the years, I've tried to engage Amnesty International and other human rights groups to care about this issue. I've worked to get media coverage and I remain in regular contact with advocates nationally and with former staff and survivors of the Judge Rotenberg Center. Together, we've tried often with little success to pass state and federal legislation and regulations that would protect people from the abuses of electric shock and other aversive procedures. The tides turned when JRC became the focus of advocates who themselves are disabled. When Autistic Self-Advocacy Network published Quentin Davies' Prisoner of the Apparatus, when Lydia Brown became, began maintaining the history with their living archive and repository on the Judge Rotenberg Center's abuses, and when ASAN adapt and occupy JRC organized actions and protests. The biggest tide turner was when JRC survivors like Jennifer Masumba spoke out, telling their stories with bravery and heart and in horrifying detail. Although non-disabled professionals and advocates had tried to fight this battle for years, hearing Jennifer's story in her authentic voice led directly to the FDA's ban of the electric shock devices in early March of this year. People often think that the FDA put an end to the use of electric shock at JRC. Sadly, JRC's ability to continue using them as instruments of torture goes on uninterrupted. JRC challenged the FDA's decision using the current pandemic as one of the reasons that they could not transition people off the shock devices. The FDA agreed to postpone the ban until after COVID is no longer a national emergency and until JRC has sufficient time to challenge the FDA ruling in DC Circuit Court. The devices have been banned, but as we meet tonight to celebrate the success of advocates in finally achieving that goal, people at JRC are still subject to this abuse. And knowing how slowly the wheels of justice grind, they may well be prisoners of the apparatus for years to come. This battle has been long, slow, and has yielded little for the 250 or so people still housed at the Judge Rotenberg Center. Over $64 million a year in public funds still support people to be subject to electric shock that one expert described as roughly twice as painful as what pain researchers have demonstrated is tolerable for humans. Disabled people are the victims of some of the worst and most accepted discrimination in the country. They represent the last bastion of sanctioned segregation and torture. While this continues, it does not discount the efforts of so many advocates who speak out on behalf of those who still suffer at JRC and in other institutionalized settings. I want to thank ASAN for honoring the survivors of JRC tonight and for being a steadfast voice for the rights and humane treatment of people who are victimized. It is this unwavering advocacy that will hopefully someday put an end to this madness. Thank you. Twenty twenty has definitely been a difficult year, but one of the positive things this year was the fact that the Food and Drug Administration did make the rule final that um, banned the use of electric shock devices. 
um, at the Judge Rottenberg Center, which is the only place that currently used or continues to use those devices. It is hard to believe that in 2020 that had to be banned. Um, it also unfortunately continues to be something that is being debated in court. Um, and the fact of the matter remains that work continues, continually needs to be done still uh, in the areas of banning restraint and seclusion when it comes to people with disabilities and young students with disabilities. There remains a lot of work to be done. Um, I work for the ARC. My name is Nicole Drorwick. I should have started with that. Uh, I've been proud to work with the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network on um, stopping the shock, um, but there is still a lot of work to do. The ARC has been at the forefront of eliminating these torturous practices um, but again, we still have a lot of work to do uh, in order to make sure that we don't misconstrue behaviors um, as anything other than what they are, which is a form of communication. Uh, and so we will continue to fight until everyone's right to be respected is upheld. Thank you, be well, and the fight goes on. I'm Margaret Nigren, CEO of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, AAIDD, and I'm pleased to be a part of the 2020 Asan Gala. Today, I want to acknowledge and honor the survivors of electric shock treatment and to thank all the advocates who have worked to ban the use of electric shock devices, including Asan. Hashtag Stop the Shock. The road to getting the Food and Drug Administration to ban the devices was long, and it is an important victory in our struggle to make sure that no one is subjected to aversives, restraints, or seclusion. This victory was achieved through the dedicated work of many, many advocates and organizations, including ASAN and AAIDD. Advocates told their stories over and over again. Advocates made a difference. Unfortunately, we still have work to do. The only entity in the United States to use electric shock devices is currently fighting implementation of the FDA ban. ASAN, AAIDD, and other organizations are working through the courts to ensure that the FDA ban is enforced without exception. In addition, restraint and seclusion practices have not been eradicated in the United States yet. I know that by working together, we will achieve a world in which all people are treated with dignity. Thank you. It was pretty sudden and unexpected earlier this year during the Trump administration of all times to learn that the FDA had banned the use of um, contingent electric shock devices as used at the Judge Rotenberg Center. Uh, it was so sudden that it was kind of hard to process that we'd won at least a big part of the battle. We'd stop the shock since our slogan had gone. Um, and of course, we hadn't won yet as the ban has not yet gone into effect and is on hold. Um, while JRC fights the FDA over it. But nonetheless, I still believe, hopefully not overly optimistically, that we are on the verge of winning this particular battle against the JRC permanently. That being said, we can't rest on our laurels. JRC used aversives other than electric shock for approximately 15 years before it started using shock devices. It broke ammonia pills under people's nose. It forced them into cold showers as punishment. It put white noise helmets over their head to bombard them with noise while depriving them of sight. These things are still allowed. They will go back to them. They might fight to expand them, and we can't afford to declare victory and go home because the most notorious of their forms of reversives have been banned. Um, nor can we stop with the Judge Rotenberg Center. I fully believe we should fight until that particular institution is closed down, but it's only a symptom of a larger problem 
of dehumanization of autistic people, of the belief that fixing us is worth whatever cost and whatever uh, neurotypical people define as fixing us is justified and justifies anything. Therefore, we have to know how JRC or places like it could pop back up elsewhere in the future, but also fight the more subtle manifestations of that kind of ableism, um, be willing to find them out, be, uh, be actively searching for them and finding ways to respond, ways that will require more subtlety to match the subtlety of these more implicit forms of anti-autistic ableism and other forms of marginalization, which of course will be involved. Uh, but I fully believe that we're not only capable, but motivated and uh, uh, motivated to continue this fight and that we will eventually prevail in shutting down not only JRC, but every place remotely like it. Thank you. Happy Gala Autistic Self-Advocates Network. My name is Mike Oxford, a lifelong activist in the fight to deinstitutionalize and free our people. Congratulations to us all on the release of the final regs, finally, for a decades-long fight to get that done. We need to take a minute and celebrate that victory, but we have to push those through to the final conclusion so there's no more shock. We have to keep pushing until there's no more aversives and no more institutional facilities or institutional mindsets or philosophies. We'll fight together. When the FDA announced at the beginning of the pandemic that it was finally enacting the ban that so many of us had fought for years and years to put in place. It felt like a victory, not just for our community, but a necessary psychological one during a pandemic that was taking over everybody's lives and the entire world that we live in. It was important for us to understand that after a hearing in which an expert questioned whether autistic people could even feel pain, that the FDA finally believed that it needed to make the shocks illegal. But of course, we have so much farther to go. For one, the ban isn't even in effect. The JRC was able to stop the ban from coming into effect, ironically and horrifically using the pandemic to prevent it. And of course, even if and when the ban does actually become realized, there will still be people at the JRC being abused in other ways, and there will still be people with all different types of disabilities in other institutions, nursing homes, long-term residential facilities, group homes, jails and prisons, and for disabled people who have been at the margins of the margins, who face the brunt of institutionalization and incarceration, while we work toward the day in which there will be no more institutions of any kind, we are hoping for the day that JRC specifically will finally not just stop the shocks, but be closed because it, it has been a site of so much harm and trauma and violence, especially for the majority disabled black and brown people that have been confined there. But my hope also is that as we look forward to the future, we start thinking about what reparations for the survivors will look like? How will we teach about the atrocities that happened there and in other institutions? How will we give some small measure of compensation, at least to account for years lost to abuse to those who survived what happened in the JRC? I don't have answers, but I do know that this community has always been at its most powerful when we are fighting against the enemies and the systems that seek to harm us. And I believe that we will harness that power as we move forward. And finally, once and for all, stop the shocks and close JRC. I'm going to speak personally for just a minute. I moved from state level to national advocacy 
when a student I was working with was almost put in a placement that would lead to the JRC. For all the years that I've been working on this, the moment that stands out the most in my mind is from the 2014 FDA hearing. The experts were going over evidence of the harms of the devices, of the harms of the devices, pain, distress, and so on. One of the known side effects of the device is that it can burn your skin. The expert from the JRC angrily denied that anyone had ever been burned by the device. The panel showed the JRC expert pictures of burns that they had. They asked if he'd like to revise his statement. He said, that depends upon your definition of the word burn. People with developmental disabilities, I guess, our burns don't count the same. If you read the FDA's deliberations in the Federal Register as they prepare the ban, they talk about how the JRC argues that there is still debate in the literature as to whether or not people with developmental disabilities, especially non-speaking people, feel pain. Or, if we feel pain, is it as bad as it is for people without disabilities? Should it count in the same way? Do we count? Are we people? That's what this fight is about. We have been forced to spend years debating whether people with intellectual and developmental disabilities feel pain like everyone else, whether our disabilities disqualify us from human rights, and whether we deserve to live free from fear and abuse. So, this fight does not end with the ban, but the ban is, pardon my language, a big fucking deal. And that is why, even though we are not done, even though we recognize the JRC's defiance, we are still taking a moment today to celebrate our progress. And our celebration is also our commitment. We will see this through to the end. Even when the ban is finally fully implemented, our work won't be done. While the JRC will be forbidden from using electric shock devices, it will still exist and it will still be allowed to use other forms of torture and abuse, including starving its residents as a means of punishment. Nor is the JRC the only residential facility which tortures, injures, and kills people with disabilities. Their use of electric shocks may have been unique, but deliberate, deliberate abuse by staff is endemic to congregate settings. When we isolate people with disabilities in segregated settings, then give service providers total control over every aspect of our lives, we are facilitating abuse and neglect. We must do better for all people with disabilities. We must finish closing the institutions that still exist across the country. We must end the use of aversives, restraint and seclusion, and abusive therapies across the board. And we must make meaningful, robust community living services an option and a reality in every state. We must hold accountable the systems that allow the Judge Rottenberg Center to torture with impunity and ensure that violence against people with disabilities is recognized as violence, even when it is done for our own good. The Judge Rottenberg Center itself, which has demonstrated an unyielding ideological commitment to torturing people with disabilities, must be shut down, and the survivors must be finally supported to live safe, self-determined lives in their communities. We have a long way to go, but I want to end by acknowledging, again, that we got this far because of all of you. Your advocacy and the energy you put into this is what got us to the ban. We will need all of you in this fight through to the end. This is the end of the JRC portion of our gala. As your day and the gala continues, please practice self-care in whatever way works best for you. This is a really heavy topic. Thank you for taking the time to sit with it. At 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will begin our LGBTQ plus rights and neurodiversity panel. I'll see you all then.